Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third annual uh, Weatherford College Interdisciplinary Academic Conference. I'm Cheryl Boswell. I will be hosting today's webinar. And here we go. Today we're going to be hearing a uh, presentation from Dr. Kathy Johnson. Let's see. Music or co host. Here we go. All right. And she's going to be telling us about horses, dogs, and some others at war. So if you have any questions, just make sure you utilize the uh, chat at the bottom. And Kathy, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Cheryl. No I thought I had um, my video up, but I guess I didn't, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go ahead and start, go to the screen sharing right now. At least I hope we are. Okay. Uh, screen share. Wait a minute. Screen one. Oh, I'm sorry. I had the wrong screen. Sorry. Okay. All right. Well, come on. Where's the screen sharing? <sighs> Hold on just a second. Okay. There's the right one. All right. What is going on here? Hold on just a second. Maybe it's my... Oh, there we go. That's what it was. Okay. All right. So let's try again. Nope, oh, nope. Because this is a PowerPoint and it's not going to work without the screen sharing. Oh, come on. I hate, I hate technology. Hold on just a second. New share. Screen one. This always works for my um share sound share <clears throat> bummer all right hold on just a second what is happening oh, share your screen sharing is paused stop Oop, wait all right, let me try again. I do not know why it is not screen sharing. Share. Damn it. Sorry, probably shouldn't say that. Okay. Um, hold on. Cheryl, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Why is it not letting me screen share? Um, I, I can normally screen share in Zoom, no problem. Scott said that when you put me in there as a co-webinator or whatever, that it yeah, would. Almost, yeah. And I'm it says sure. I'm screen sharing, but all it's showing is. Yeah, because I can see your presentation on my computer. Oh, you can? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, then maybe it is sharing and I'm just not seeing it. Okay. All right. I'm going to go with that. All right. All right. I'm sorry, folks. All right, so <laughs> we'll go with that. All right, thank you. All right, so it's horses, dogs, and some others in wartime. And um, I will say I come to this as a horse owner and a dog owner, and all my life I've read about these stories. And, and so it's very easy for me to do and some more deep diving into the history of it. And of course, you know, there are the familiar suspects. This, of course, is Robert E. Lee riding his traveler who he rode all through the war, who was actually a gift by the people of Virginia to Lee. And like most of the Confederate um, officers and men, he owned the, his own horses. And indeed, uh, Traveler actually outlived uh, General Lee. He lived for a few years after Lee died and I think it was 1869. But anyway, we are familiar with these kinds of images. Uh, and then, of course, we have after the Civil War, we had the Indian Wars out on the Western frontier. And this is actually Comanche. He was the sole survivor of the Battle of Little Bighorn. And he was actually found wandering the battlefield. He had multiple um, wounds to him, but he was taken care of, recovered. 
and he became a favorite of the U.S. Army, and he had an honored uh, history with them until his death of a natural death. So, you know, those are kind of old uh, stories, but we expect, of course, during this period, horses were integral to war, but it's in the modern era where I really want to focus on today and, and to talk about World War One and Two, and even Korea, Vietnam, and believe it or not, the war on terror. So we'll start with the First World War. And indeed, as soon as the United States goes into the war, there is an immediate, which is actually not until 1917, but by the time that that happens, we know that all aspects of recruitment are open for fair game. And one of the positive feel-good stories that had come out of the First World War was the role of dogs as mercy uh, animals in the no man's land between the trenches. It was so dangerous that stretcher bearers even uh, refused to go and help uh, wounded soldiers. So they quickly started utilizing dogs. And um, so we get this image that is used actually on a recruiting poster to shy um, American men, I suppose, you know, if a dog enlists, why not you? And sticking with uh, recruiting posters, uh, indeed, the cavalry was still part of the United States Army at the beginning of the First World War. And it was used as a recruiting tool, you know, individuals with horsemanship and horse experience were encouraged to enlist for that purpose. Indeed, the cavalry stayed mounted in the U.S. Army through the Second World War, actually. There was a cavalry unit in the Philippines at the time of the Second World War. And while the Army had shifted over to motorized transportation, we do know that uh, horses retained a, a really important role in the, role in the hearts of the U.S. Army. And they actually served during the First World War. They served uh, garrison duty here in the States. They, they did border patrols and they did other things. Not a whole lot of US cavalry horses were actually shipped out to the First World War, but artillery horses were. The US relied on horses to pull artillery uh, all throughout the First World War. And so, uh, if you're going to have this number of horses, and we're talking over a million horses, uh, we need veterinary care as well. So in, indeed, veterinarians were recruited to join uh, the fighting effort as well. I thought this was a really interesting depiction here because it does show a horse ambulance. And if any of you are horsemen, you know that horses, especially injured horses, really don't like to back out of a trailer. And you can see they what they do here is they unhitch the 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 horse who's pulling the the cart, and then they can open the front and allow the injured animal to walk more easily out the front. So this was very much uh, there were plans in place. They did have a whole mechanism for taking care of horses. Indeed, all throughout the American history, particularly from the Civil War on, the provision of quality saddle horses for the army became a very important component of government policy. Uh, the army remount service provided well-bred stallions uh, for breeding fees, very modest breeding fees for farmers in the Midwest and West in order to produce a higher quality of saddle horse than that the army could um, purchase and have in their inventory. So indeed, one, as I did some research, particularly on the different forces involved in, in particularly the First World War, one of the determinants of how many horses they had, particularly after the First World War and in going into the second, was how robust their domestic horse rearing industry was. And America always had a, a steady, large supply of horses. But still, despite that, though, after the wars, the United States Army policy was to motorize. And so they really heavily invested in mechanized vehicles because they had a ready supply of petroleum to run those vehicles. 
Conversely, a country like Germany always had a petroleum shortage, which is why they're going to continue to have a very high number and rely very much on horse transportation during the first and all the way through the Second World War as well. All right, but back to the First World War. Uh, very quickly, it became clear that the role for cavalry horses in the traditional uh, way was no longer applicable. Uh, with modern technology, machine guns, trenches, wire defenses, horses were so vulnerable to these things that it was very quickly, um, they were taken off the front line as, as um, what's the word I want to use? Well, anyway, they, they, and then they were changed over, switched over to become draft animals. Because if you look in this picture, these are riding horses. They're even, their packs um, are artillery shells and they've been ad hoc made from saddles. You can still see the stirrup irons there. So these are riding horses. They're being led by their bridles, but they've been quickly refitted into becoming pack animals. And of course, this picture also points out one of the reasons why horses became so important, even for the mechanized armies, was because of the mud. You can see they're in um, hawk deep, knee deep mud. And um, indeed, this was one of the continuing struggles with the First World War was the mud and the horrible mud. And, even uh, for horses, uh, the mud could get too deep. And so here we have a team of heavier horses, but one has clearly fallen off the road surface. If you look over there on the right, you can see the road surface is reinforced by logs, by small logs, which was a very common way to make a reinforced road. But this horse has slipped off that reinforcement into mud. He, he's in four feet of mud. And you know the expression on that horse's face and his handlers, everyone knows that that horse is not getting out of that mud by himself. So you know the war was, the First World War was particularly a horrific event for just about everybody involved, but the, the, the carnage to horses particularly uh, was incredible. The British Army sent uh, about a million horses and mules over uh, to France. And of those million, they estimate that about a half of that number were actually killed from in enemy action. You know, So they were killed or they died as a result of being in action. And of course, horses are also very vulnerable to a lot of diseases and problems. And they have to be fed quality food in order to be able to do this kind of work. And so, you know, as a horse owner, it, I look at these conditions and, and think it's a miracle they survived at all. But again, if you have horses, you know how willing they are to work. Uh, their work ethic is, is tremendous and they're willing to put up with privation and suffering uh, is, is just phenomenal. And, and it breaks your heart when you think about, you know, the horses that are willing to, to do this and keep going until they literally would drop in their traces. Uh, and indeed, uh, the humane relief efforts for horses became a bit of a wartime cause for animal lovers in England. Um, and, and the idea was that to, to try and uh, help raise money to take care of these animals, to, to rehabilitate them. And this became very much uh, something that Engl the English did. All right, so uh, dogs are also uh, utilized kind of informally initially by the allied forces and more uh, deliberately by the Axis or the, uh, I guess in the First World War, we would refer to them as the, um, well, let's just go with the Germans. Okay, and the Austro-Hungarians, anyway. Um, dogs would be used uh, oftentimes to run messages and because they were lower to the ground, they were less susceptible than a human runner was to being uh, hit by snipers, especially as trench warfare uh, was settled in. It became very uh, much uh, a, a 
a war of keeping your head down, right? And indeed, uh, snipers did a lot of the activity in between uh, actual battles being waged. And so as a consequence, human movement was oftentimes restricted. And dogs weren't just kind of informally used as runners. They were also uh, having a companion animal or a pet was very much a, a tradition in the British Army and in other units as well. This, this long time um, uh, habit of having either a regimental pet or maybe a shipboard pet uh, was very actually very common. So these animals, whether they wanted to or not, kind of got pulled into the wartime experience. Uh, dogs, of course, were uh, most famously used in the First World War as these rescue dogs. And this was not too surprising because when we think about um, the European shepherd breeds, particularly the Belgian breeds, uh, the Malinois, and which are actually the most um, of uh, the go-to canine dog for the US military today are Belgian Shepherds. But they had, were also used by farmers to pull carts and to, to you know, light carts and to do a lot of uh, very responsible jobs. Uh, so they, they are very adaptive to training. Uh, they're good sized dogs, they're strong, they're sturdy. And so they adapted to becoming the Red Cross service dogs that did um, oftentimes perform very heroically in, in, in bringing first aid to troops where humans could not travel. And some were rewarded uh, and made quite famous. Um, the Germans utilized uh, their dogs as sentry animals and also as part of the attack. And the, the thing that's unique about this picture is you notice too that both the dogs and the soldiers are wearing gas masks. Uh, the German army was the army that first utilized gas uh, as a, a form of um, warfare. And so they came prepared uh, with that. And you can see the elaborate uh, means by which the dogs as well as the people are covered by gas. And indeed, over time, um, equipping any breathing uh, mammal with a gas mask becomes an imperative in warfare. And we see that um, horses are, have gas masks later on as well, too. So the German dogs, uh, they, they tended to focus on either Doberman Pinschers or Rottweilers. They had bred for a long time dogs to, to serve in military purposes. And this is, you know, actually a long history of dogs being used in warfare way back in um, uh, early times. <laughs> we know that uh, uh, the Romans used uh, a mastiff type of dog, a, a large big dog, as part of their uh, legionnaires uh, tools to subdue uh, foreign tribes. And uh, other um, European tribes use dogs as part of their warfare uh, as well, too. So this is uh, a long history of humans and dogs, and it's no surprise that they have also gone to war together. And dogs being used with their better sense of smell, at this time, dogs were really used to detect human activity. So they were used as sentries. But we know that um, military dogs today are most valued for their, their noses to detect things like um, um, uh, explosive devices and, and bombs. All right, so in the First World War, another unsung animal hero was actually the pigeon. Uh, and, you know, the British were great. Um, uh, fans of uh, racing pigeons and, and, and all, you know, with the homing ability of pigeons. And so it, 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 it didn't take a lot of uh, thought to imagine using the pigeons to overcome a communication problem that everyone had in the trenches of the First World War, especially as men advanced out of the trenches, they lost communication with their leadership 
And the leadership, of course, wanted to know what was happening and whether or not their advance had been successful. And so as a consequence, um, pigeons were used to carry messages uh, back to relate um, what, uh, what, what the status was. This pigeon, if you notice, is actually got a camera uh, attached to the harness that it's wearing. And the pigeons would uh, be used to fly over enemy territory. And I'm not exactly sure how they accomplished this, but they would take pictures then. And, and so the idea was that they could do that as well. Um, the, the, the thousands, hundreds of thousands of pigeons that were used uh, are, are, it's just a, a really fascinating story because these little birds were actually pretty plucky in a way. And many were shot at because both sides, or well, actually the Germans really realized the importance of the pigeons as communication. And so they took to shooting at the birds whenever they saw them flying around. And so these birds would often arrive back at their, at their perch, I guess, um, with wounded, uh, with bleeding and, and, and injured. And indeed, um, I remember reading just about 10 years ago, they were tearing down an old house in England and they found a wartime pigeon uh, that had, uh, was in the chimney and had been uh, mummified in the chimney. So, you know, these, these things are really amazing. And, and again, you know, the British love their animals and some of these pigeons became heroic um, uh, members of, uh, or awarded medals after the war as well. Uh, the British uh, in the First World War, of course, it was a worldwide war and the Middle East was very much in play. And the British utilized um, camels, not just to move artillery, uh, but um, also to move wounded. These are actually camels that are being um, uh, carrying wounded on them. You can see, so that's fascinating too. So I think, you know, part of the story here is creativity and using animals that are best adapted to the terrain and the environment. Uh, back to pigeons. Um, this is actually a pigeon being released, you know, from a tank to send the message back. One of the reasons communications were so poor in the First World War was any kind of telegraphic or telephone communication required a wire. And wires were very susceptible to being damaged by uh, artillery shells, which was the principal weapon used in the First World War. And so it was very difficult to sustain uh, a communication line, especially as uh, if, if troops were advancing and moving rapidly. So the pigeons became very important for this. And indeed, whole units were created. And you can hear the mobile uh, pigeon coop because this is the deal. Pigeons fly back to their homes. And it does take some training and it takes them a while for them to acclimate to their home. And I suppose you couldn't move it too drastically, but this could be behind the lines and it could uh, be close to headquarters and allow for a fairly rapid um, communication. Okay, so let's keep moving. Uh, now we're gonna kind of segue to the Second World War. And in fact, this is a US Army horse who is now prepared uh, including gas mask for uh, in, in the inner uh, war period, this was part of the training. This was something that was recognized. Gas was now a possibility of being used despite being um, uh, declared um, illegal by the Geneva Convention. It was still uh, a consideration. Another thing uh, towards the end of the war that veterinarians and scientists uh, discussed and actually wrote papers about was the impact of radiation uh, from atomic weaponry on, on horses and other animals um, and how to deal with that. But here we've got our um, US Army remount horse, Bay Gelding in a McClellan saddle, and he's ready to go. As I said, the one active cavalry regiment in US Army by the Second World War was stationed in the Philippines. And indeed, um, they were part of the collapse of the Philippines and their dismounted um, 
riders became part of the um, a large part of of the um, uh, Americans captured and um, on the Bataan Peninsula. Uh, but before the United States is in the Second World War, Britain uh, is facing wartime uh, travails again. And so we have in 1939, as it is clear that detente with uh, Hitler is not working, appeasement is not working. Um, and as after England declares war in September of 1939, after Germany invades Poland, we get uh, now uh, a number of bureaucratic uh, uh, activity going, preparing England for war, preparing the civilian population for war. And one of the things that they did was to talk specifically, mainly towards people who lived in the, the big cities, the target cities of air raids, and uh, particularly in London, and this was about uh, dealing with animals and in air raids. And basically the recommendation was to destroy your pets, uh, to euthanize your pets before the trauma of the war and the terror and, and possible injury. And, um, and this was actually kind of a shocking uh, moment in, in British history when you think about how much the English love and cherish their dogs and cats. Uh, but indeed, they produced a pamphlet and it included instructions on how, you know, animals could be uh, euthanized and people were uh, told to go to their veterinarians and, and there were set up other shelters. Now, many people said, wait, 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 don't be so hasty. But in that first week after this announcement was made, we know that um, 170, no, I'm sorry, 750,000 dogs and cats were euthanized in one week. Uh, that's how um, frightened the British were. That's how also, I guess, how obedient to laws they were. But it was very much the reality. Besides the, the concern about animals running around loose and from bombed out houses or injuries or whatnot, there was also a real concern as the war went on about rationing and feeding animals. And it was made very clear early on that there would be no ration points allowed for city animals, dogs and cats, right? And indeed, you know, by the end of the war, the British civilian was living on a very, very strict ration, a very low amount of calories. So there just wasn't a whole lot to share even with your dogs and cats, although it was available. Uh, meat like horse meat and whale meat uh, would, be, um, would be made available um, uh, uh, for animal consumption, but um, again, uh, it was a sacrifice that people had to make. But for those who kept their animals, um, again, uh, the picture on the left here, the woman is walking her dog and both she and her dog are wearing blackout preventative uh, because during the blackout in the big cities, in London particularly, the, there was no lighting. This would just be a beacon for the German bombers to focus on. So the streets were dark, and this meant, though, that when you were taking your pet out for his evening uh, necessary, that it might make him vulnerable. So wearing a white, uh, something bright that would catch what little uh, muffled headlight was allowed for motor vehicles was deemed to be an imperative. Behind the woman, you can see, too, how the glass windows are taped uh, to prevent uh, uh, excessive blast damage. And indeed, uh, London really buckled down, but it's going to be a year before the war uh, uh, comes to London, and it's going to be September of 1940, where we um, have what we think of as the Battle of Britain, and the Blitz begins in London and other um, English cities. But, you know, the preparation for that included uh, a great deal of, uh, you know, evacuation of children, again, elimination or evacuation of pets and all as well. You can see on the right side as well, 
um, that the dogs were used in you know search and rescue from bomb damage. And indeed, um, um, there was uh, about a million uh, British citizens who were killed um, in the Blitz over the course of the, the war. And now you can see, particularly small dogs, this is a little terrier. You know, the, these are, it doesn't take much to take a dog who's was bred and developed to search out rats and whatnot uh, in, in, in small places for them to very quickly learn to start looking for humans in the same situation. And oftentimes little dogs especially were able to accomplish things that bigger dogs couldn't do. It just brings to mind a story about um, a little dog, a, a small terrier that was used to run a telegraph line uh, I think this was in the First World War, but it was, he went through a, 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 a pipe, a long pipe, and he um, sent it, uh, he carried it through. So, you know, dogs have all kinds of uses, uh, for sure. So the war, the Second World War has started, it's a war in Europe. And we know that what really takes the pressure off the um, potential invasion uh, of Britain is actually uh, the German strategy. They reverse, they kind of turn around and, and, and they attack uh, and invade the Soviet Union instead. But you know, part of the planned invasion for England included um, bringing along tens of thousands of horses. So, you know, the German invasion plans, which very quickly became pretty much impossible and, and everybody seemed to accept this except um, Hitler, uh, was that you know to make this amphibious invasion across the channel, not only to move all the men, but to move all the horses that the German army needed to continue to move supplies and equipment was just kind of mind boggling. And the thought of loading and unloading all of these horses under air attack or um, mortar fire or cannon fire uh, was just just really mind-boggling uh, because they're going on and off these barges uh, and in the surf and everything so uh, but it, it never came to a German invasion but we know that in the Second World War fully 80 percent of the German army was horse-drawn uh, they had a real um, petroleum shortfall. They had, uh, they didn't have any natural source of petroleum. Uh, they always um, were very miserly with the use of their petroleum and it was reserved for their tanks and for airplanes. And as a consequence, Germany still moved on the back of horses and um, they had most of their transport, all of their artillery uh, was mostly horse drawn. And of course, when you've got this many horses and um, Germany used 2.75 million horses in the war, when you have that many horses, they have to be fed, they have to be cared for, they, you know, they break down, they have to be replaced. But Germany was in a pretty good position to do this because they did have a national breeding program to breed a very um, tractable, very sturdy, um, horse, several breeds actually, that were very um, rideable and again, very, um, but, but still strong enough and sturdy enough. And, uh, and so this, this really well-organized breeding program offset the, the fact that they didn't have a good um, supply of gasoline. And so they knew they'd have to do this. Uh, but when, by turning to, um, um, turning to Russia though was, was, had tragic consequences, of course, for the German army, uh, but also for the poor horses that, that went along with them. And, uh, you know, this is a horse pretty much at the end of his rope um, in Russia. Of course, the weather is, the winter has come and uh, like, uh, you know, like Napoleon and, and his army, uh, 150 years before, uh, the Russian winter did most of the damage. And, um, you know, the German army just disappeared in Russia, basically, and, and the horses that went with them uh, did as well, too. The Russians themselves um, uh, used cavalry throughout the war. 
uh, they were mechanizing and they had petroleum, but they also had so many people and uh, they utilized horses as well. They had their Cossacks still in the Second World War. Uh, the United States dis uh, embarked lots of horses for service, mostly in the Pacific, um, but these are heavier horses. These are, are still uh, artillery horses. And then actually, no, that's the Second World War. Uh, they also use, besides horses, and uh, they would go over, uh, these are being loaded into rail cars, as you can see, um, but they also used mules. And especially in the tropical um, theaters of the war, so in the Pacific and on the Indian subcontinent and in the Southeast Asia, uh, we know that um, uh, mules were also used. <laughs> now, a mule is a hybrid of a donkey and a horse. And mules are sterile. Uh, they don't reproduce. They're a unique uh, creature uh, recognized by their long ears from their donkeys. But they're, they have hybrid vigor. And they're incredibly um, self um, self-aware, I guess is a good way of describing a mule. They have a, a really strong sense of self-preservation. You know, you can kill a horse by overworking them and they'll let you do it. They'll, 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 they, will, they, will, they will jump off cliffs. They'll do whatever you ask them to do. Mules, on the other hand, are not uh, that stupid. Um, and uh, you can see uh, the mule is being loaded up into a transport airplane, which was the easiest way of moving these mules around. There was actually this rather tragic but aborted uh, attempt to see if you could parachute mules out of planes. That didn't work. Um, and only half the mules who were being tested actually were foolish enough to allow themselves to be pitched out of the airplane. The other half observed and, and said, no way. Um, but mules were utilized throughout Burma and again, India. And they were very important because again, of the dense jungle and, and, and all. Um, uh, here we see more. Uh, this is a mule with full pack and everything being unloaded and utilized in uh, that Asian theater. And so for a little bit of a segue, uh, we also, I had to dig around and find my cat story. And this actually, this was the best of all the cat stories. This is a, a cat who was named, um, eventually he was nicknamed Unsinkable Sam. And he was a German cat originally. And he was actually one of the very few survivors of the battleship Bismarck. You know, one of the first big naval engagements of the Second World War was when the new big uh, uh, battleship, the pride of the German Navy tried to break out of the North Sea and into the Atlantic. And the British Navy uh, managed to keep this from happening and eventually sunk the Bismarck. And um, there was a very few uh, number of survivors, but one of them was this cat was found uh, uh, floating on a plank of wood after the Bismarck had sunk and was grabbed by the English and became um, a, uh, a pet on uh, an English destroyer called the Cossack. Well, I guess while we could say that Sam had nine lives, he did uh, have some bad luck because the Cossack was sunk and, um, and he was found once again floating uh, on a piece of debris and his new home was the English aircraft carrier, the Ark Royal, which ironically was, was the lead ship in, that was the airplanes from the Ark Royal were responsible for disabling the Bismarck and allowing her to be um, um, it, unmaneuverable. And so then she was um, uh, sunk. Um, and anyway, so she uh, was then on the Ark Royal and believe it or not, um, that was uh, also sunk. And so then uh, she was, um, I think she got onto a lifeboat that time and then she was retired from the Naval Service and lived out her life as a mascot on dry land. Um, but this was really common. Um, most vessels had cats. Cats were really useful on board ship for killing rats and, 
and indeed uh, they have been part of sailing and naval tradition for a long, long time because of their usefulness and utility. Cats were also really popular in the First World War in the trenches, again, to kill the rats. So we know that um, this was uh, a big part of having a cat around was deemed to be good luck and, and all. Um, so we also, dogs are being utilized in the Second World War. Again, uh, you can see these two Airedales are, are kind of training, I think, to do their bit. And something else that happened during the Second World War that was really interesting was dogs were used as sentries and to detect um, the presence of the enemy, especially in the Pacific. And, and as the Marine Corps moved across the Pacific island by island, and the Japanese defenders became more and more entrenched, sentry dogs and dogs that would detect the presence of these hidden Japanese soldiers became lifesavers for the Marines. And so there was a call put out to American families, to dog owners, uh, to enlist their dogs to become war dogs in the Pacific. And indeed, hundreds of family pets were given up uh, to the Marine Corps, because mostly they wanted dogs like Labrador Retrievers, Shepherds, and, you know, bigger dogs like that. And, uh, but most of those dogs were actually returned, the, the ones that survived, uh, uh, were returned to their families, and all but a handful were able to transition back into civilian life. And again, so America during the Second World War was, you know, everyone made sacrifices. And the idea was that, you know, Fido or whatever, Shep would go off to war as well was, was an important one. And besides, you know, besides dogs providing a really important detection uh, mechanism, dogs were also really critical for um, just providing humanity to the soldiers and Marines and sailors who are suffering from the traumas of war, you know, to be able to pet an animal and to, to, to focus on an animal, it kind of brought out the human in everybody. Um, um, besides, uh, during the wartime, of course, there was a shortage of everything and circus elephants were actually employed to plow ground and to replace some of the horses that had, were no longer available. Uh, and to do other things. So oftentimes, even if the circus animals just uh, plowed the ground that raised uh, their own food, they were, they were ahead of the game. So I found that um, in the archives. So um, with World War II over, uh, then we go back into war again in, in Korea. And uh, horses weren't part of the plan, but uh, uh, very quickly, um, the Marine Corps, uh, actually uh, one Marine, uh, platoon, they were had a heavy uh, 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 mechanical rifle. It was basically an, uh, 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 a tube uh, mortar. And it um, fired these shells. And you can see this is actually Sergeant Reckless. And she has is carrying her load of shells. These were heavy shells. And she could carry four uh, on a load. She's actually a small little Korean um, thoroughbred. She was bought off the racetrack by her um, owner handler, this Marine Lieutenant. And because the men could only haul one of these shells at a time and, and he, he saw a real, a, a real a need here for a pack animal and he was a horseman himself. He asked his wife to send a pack saddle from the States. She did, he went down and bought this horse off the track for $300. And she became a, a real uh, important component of the Marine Corps in Korea, and her story is just wonderful. Um, she, uh, in, in the heat of a battle, she uh, continued to ferry shells back and forth. She didn't even need a handler. She went, she went up to where the gun was firing, and then she would go back uh, to where the shells were held back in reserve, and they'd load her up again, and she would just go on her own. And during that action, she would received uh, several shrapnel injuries. And, uh, and when the war was over, there was no uh, plan to bring her back, by at least by the officials. But the Marine Corps um, uh, pitched a fit, and uh, she was brought back with full ceremony. 
She ended her career as a sergeant in the Marine Corps. Uh, she was decorated. She had two Purple Hearts and uh, she lived out her life in Camp Pendleton. Uh, so after Korea, of course, we have Vietnam and, and elephants were utilized again by South Vietnamese troops in Vietnam. I'm running out of time here, so I'll get us caught up. Um, but, and then in the war on terror, particularly in Afghanistan, right away it was discovered that um, mules were critical for packing in the, um, the mountains. Mules are very sure-footed, and, and in fact, this became such an important role that uh, the Marine Corps now has a, a training facility uh, or had a training facility where young Marine recruits were taught how to manage mules so that when they went in country and, and got a hold of mules that they would know how to work these animals and to utilize them. And indeed, one of the most iconic images of the war on terror was that first um, horse-borne charge by special forces in Afghanistan, um, you know, riding local, local horses. So we probably never get away from it, uh, uh, if, sadly for the animals part, but, you know, I think, uh, if you ask any serviceman or woman who has experienced uh, uh, time away, uh, the presence of animals is, has been a great comfort. Indeed, um, um, uh, American servicemen and women in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, actually uh, have adopted a number of pets and they were brought back to uh, the United States through the combined efforts of a lot of animal uh, rights groups and, and service groups to enable those service members to continue to keep those animals beside themselves. And of course, service dogs today are incredibly important in um, the military to protect and save lives. All right, so with that, I think I'm gonna sum it up. If we have any questions, I don't know that we even have time for that, but uh, more than happy to answer any questions uh, that anyone might have. Thank you, Kathy. That was very interesting. Um, I was curious about like animals during uh, Vietnam because I had heard about some dogs being used in Vietnam and the ones that did survive, not all of them got brought back. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. It, that was a really sad moment in American uh, war dog history. And that was one of the reasons why we treat dogs very differently now. But yes, the, the mostly German shepherds that were trained and were used in Vietnam very uh, much, and there were thousands of these, they were uh, all euthanized before, they were not brought back. And with very few exception, they were euthanized. And today, the way we do it is that the dogs, you know, if the handler wants to keep the dog, that's usually what they try to do. Now, there are a few cases where the dogs just really, you know, because one of the things they've discovered is the dogs suffer from PTSD as well. And that they are oftentimes um, uh, suffer tremendously and 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 have mental or emotional, I should say, side effects that make their civilian going back into a family more difficult. Yeah, I couldn't imagine without my little guy here. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, I know. I came into the office, <laughs> so my guys are my guys are at home. But yes, I you know, and again, I think of my horse, and I I think of what my horse would have done for me, and and yeah. and, and and what he would have persevered to to stay by my side. And it breaks your heart because you know yes, they do it yeah, not because like a war horse. You yes, know? like mm -hmm. whenever you were showing the World War Two one images i was yeah. thinking about that war horse and that one horse that can't quite pull yeah everything. because they, they were they were all converted and and that the uh, the horse that was uh, it was a composite of stories but that horse uh was a real animal uh he in fact there's a memorial to him in in england he was he was um, the the story of the younger owner that was not that was fabricated to, for okay. you know, but the horse was there. He persevered and and again he survived being captured and then yeah it was a fantastic story, but uh yeah, so lots oh. of good stuff. And as a kid, I remember watching movies like Gallant Bess, and there was another one about um um. Uh, 
um, uh, artillery horses in the First World War mm -hmm. and one horse that survived and the other three horses in his gun carriage were killed and he pulled the the gun by himself and you know all through the barrage and was wounded and you know but they brought him home too so that's good, good. yeah well thank you um i've enjoyed it any other questions uh looks like a katie fox says i found this very interesting thank you so much oh well i my pleasure and um i will try and expand on it next time i'll go to a different era i decided to do the modern era this time yeah i'm curious to see like some of the more like ancient stuff like what uh research is out there for like the romans and maybe even like egyptians or mm -hmm. well like there what? is actually a lot and and, uh, and so uh that's uh so there's a lot of uh understanding about what they were used for and, and all but of course and there are some anecdotal stories of clearly this was a special horse, right? They were buried right. with their 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 owner, or which I don't know that that's necessarily an advantage. And I think there was one case where they found a grave where it was just the the horse. You know, the horse had died and and was buried with full honors, kind of if you will. And and so I think that the human animal bond has existed for millennia and right. uh, ever since um the domestication of horses by humans so let's go back 10 14 000 years and um yeah so anyway well it's my pleasure all right it was great i found it very interesting i can't wait to see you know what you come up with next yeah that topic. uh thank you everyone for attending and hope everyone has a great day and check out some of the other panels that are going to be coming up Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.